in the uh, previous uh, session of MATLAB fundamentals, we were looking at the data preprocessing. And uh, in data preprocessing, uh, we consider one example uh, that was about how to clean a messy and missing data from tables. So we considered one table uh, which contained not a numbers and uh, unwanted formats of data. Right, and uh, then we uh, tried to calculate uh, the oh, okay. Then we try to find out where, what which rows are containing those kind of uh, data, and we try to remove it. Uh, we looked at multiple options, either to uh, update the missing data with some standard data, or uh, you simply delete those rows. These were the options we had. We considered them. So they will go for another example. This is also a very standard example of uh, what we call as the D trend. D trending D data. Okay. So uh, the concept of D trending is very important because uh, whenever we see a data. Whenever we observe the data in the form of, uh, say, uh, maybe a graph, right? It becomes very difficult to uh, process the data when there is a trend. Trend is like, okay, continuously increasing or continuously decreasing, right? There is uh, variation, but variation plus a trend makes it difficult to process the data. So, this is the normal problem. Okay, so to overcome that, we have to perform a specific uh, task that task is called as a detraining of the data now uh, let us see how to perform the detraining operation in matlab so first let's go to the matlab screen all right so first let us create a Let's create a uh, the data set first, uh, just to visualize how to do it. Okay, just to visualize the trend first, then we'll try to eliminate the trend and perform the detrend. So uh, we'll do the programming in a M file. We'll write a complete code. Okay, just to show. So we'll write it as a okay. This is about the detrend. And uh, CIC. Usually, we write uh, these three commands just to make sure that uh, when we run the code from the beginning, fresh code, everything related to the previous code should get erased. All right, that's why we erase this. Now, uh, let's try to uh, write a code which actually uh, plots a time versus a random function okay maybe this could be we can consider this as uh, uh, the variation of a stock market or variation of a price of an item or variation of fuel prices anything okay so let's uh, do this so t is equal to uh, let me create say 0 uh, to 365 assuming uh, assuming that uh, i'm considering 365 days of an year okay and uh, now i'll create a the daily fluctuation of some price okay i will create a rand number r a n d n n means it is a number it will be created so what should be the size size should be the size of t okay so size of uh, that we date the time variable, right? Create random numbers, and the random number. If I write just one, it is one. If I write the size of t, it creates so much. Okay, and now I create the data. So my my data is equal to, right? The 
it's a cumulative sum. So if you want to take the cumulative sum, you have to use a function called sum sum, right? Of uh, the fun the, the variable I have to write, right? It's a daily daily flux, right? So I just make it more interesting, something like plus twenty plus maybe I'll add a t uh, divided by let me say. 50, it's a random number, okay? You can write anything over here, right? So t divided by 50.5, 108, uh, 2000, whatever, whatever you want to say, doesn't matter. Okay, now, so it gets created and I just want to see, right? Uh, there is a average with this. So uh, see the concept is whenever you are uh, considering a fluctuating data, which has a trend, trend is something like increasing or decreasing maybe, or increases for some time then decreases etc right like that we have a trend so whenever you have a trend the property of such functions is that it is going to have a larger mean the mean of that whole function is a larger value like 50 25 50 as some bigger number not close to zero right so the concept of d trend works with the principle that it identifies what is a mean and it tries to make the mean of that whole function zero, close to zero. So just to uh, show you this is what is happening. So let me create, uh, okay, let me first run. I'll save this and I'll run. So when I run this, you see the variables are created. Okay, okay. Uh, when it is zero to 365, you have here. So I'll reduce one so that I'll make the size exactly as 365. Okay, so zero to 365. Let me run. So now you see it becomes exactly 365. So I'll show you that there is a trend in that. Anyway, I'll plot it later. But before that, I want to show the mathematical property. So by uh, finding mean of this data, that is my data. So you see there is a average. There is a mean value of 26. As I told, you have a bigger value than 0 uh, in any data which has a trend in it. Okay, just to justify this, uh, I would like to plot it and see. I just want to plot it, right? So how to plot? Let me go to the function. I'll call figure. So I know that when I call figure, a new plot will be created. And I'm going to plot the x-axis variable, that is my time, so that is t, and the data, that is data. Right, I'll plot, then I'll give a legend. It's it's like uh, it has to show what is what. So something like uh, you can simply say the legend as maybe this is the original original data. So right, this is the original data which I'm trying to plot. Maybe I can write the x x label uh, just to uh, clear what I'm plotting. Right, x label is uh, time in days. So I'm trying to uh, plot the days along the x-axis. So y, y label, right? I'm just trying to plot, say, stocks, right? Or you can uh, also, this could be the stock price or whatever. Okay, so let's let's just plot this. So as you run, you can see that, right? This is the data, right? I'm trying to hit something at random and uh, I'm trying to plot it. So you can see that it's it, it's going to tell you that. So there is, uh, right? This blue color plot is the original data, right? There is another uh, way I can do to look this same whenever I run. So you see, this is something like every time I run, I'm going to get different, different graphs. Correct. This is because I am not uh, following the same random number generation uh, algorithm. MATLAB uses different algorithms at different times. Now, if you want to make it uh, the same every time, random numbers are generating, but using the same thing, you have to use a command called uh, the random number generator, that is RNG. Use a specific number, you can call the starting from 0, 1, 2, whatever. Right? I'll just add a some random number, some 20. 
Okay, now let us see what's going to happen. So I run this. You see, this is what I'm going to get. Once again, I'm I go back. See, I'm going to get the same. It's a random, right? But it uses the same uh, what you call right a uh, way of generation so because of that i'm getting a similar graph every time so this is another way to learn how to generate the random numbers of uh, specified uh, types every time you run so if you change this to 10 you get a different graph okay so anyway so you can use anything so this is one part of it. so anyway i created the uh, what you call a graph right the data which has a trend in it you can see the trend is that as the time progresses it is continuously increased overall it is increasing there may be fluctuation like slight increase decrease increase decrease right etc but ultimately if you see from 0 till 3, 365 it is continuously increasing all right now so let's do something about it so how to remove the trend from that so so that we can actually understand what is happening in this table okay so let's go to the next step in uh, code so in the next step i'm trying to get my d trend uh, of the data so that is d d trended my my data i'll call it by this name so i have to use a function called d trend it's a function in build function to d trend the uh, data and my data has a name that is uh, my data okay anyway i don't want to display anything i'll simply calculate what was the trend trend in my function my the function which we have created is my data which has a higher value of mean minus this answer answer is d trended my data so this is a trend okay so this is what is called as the trend the trend in the previous data uh, that is my data is that it is going to increase continuously as you move from 0 to 365 right there is fluctuation but in addition to that fluctuation there is something like continuously increasing data is continuously continuously increasing so now i am not able to exactly see what is how much is the fluctuation because it, it looks like actually continuously the increasing tendency of my data is actually suppressing the actual fluctuations i am not able to see that clearly so for that what i do i perform the d trend operation so according to this d trend operation it will try to remove the trend from the data only the fluctuation will be seen anyway we'll see that later but uh, for that we have to use a function called d uh, d trend i think i made a mistake here this is d e uh, t r e n d d trend so it performs the d trend operation of whatever data you specify in this case it is the data which we have created with a trend that is my data all right and uh, then i want to find the trend right what was the original trend in my data trend is nothing but it was increasing i just want to see that the trend was continuously increasing right how do you find that from the original data that is my data subtract the detrended data right so detrended data means my data minus trend correct so if you want to see the trend so you have to subtract my uh, from my data you have to subtract this all right so let's find this and then we'll uh, okay I'll, I'll try to uh, visualize the mean as well so let me do one thing so let me show you the mean in both cases okay mean uh, of uh, say i just want to show the my data first you see the mean of my data and also we'll see the mean of detrended my data okay so anyway i'll i'll write this this part later so let me let me make this part as a comment thing so i want to show you that this exactly 
is going to sh uh, show you that there was a trend and the trend has been removed with mathematically in terms of the mean calculation of the mean right if you remember uh, i mentioned earlier that the data which has a trend has a higher mean compared to the data without trend so i removed the trend from this so this value right should be lesser value compared to the mean of my data this is the first observation that we need to do let's go ahead so you can see that this was the, the figure one shows the right uh, trended data now we can compare uh, from the command window it's very clear that the first answer is 46.71 which is a higher value compared to the detrended data you can see that this is very small number 2.8792 into 10 to the power minus 14 right so so small number right so it's very clear that the detrended data is actually going to have a mean very close to zero okay so we understood right now we are uh, we found that this is what is going to happen when i perform the uh, detrend operation okay but uh, anyway let me uh, comment out these means and let me go to the calculation of the actual trend now so let's say that we calculated the trend trend is nothing but the difference between the uh, original data and the uh, detrended data okay now i want to plot something so let's plot something on the same curve right the figure which we had called right already there is a figure created i don't want to go for a new figure uh, i just want to plot something on the same uh, figure window so what is the option you have to perform hold on right so why do you do hold on you do not right so i want to plot something on the same graph all right so plot right my first thought is again i want to plot the time versus the trend right i'll see what is the trend and i will specify uh, the plot has to be in terms of dots uh, say red color all right so this is one of them and again i'll go for a plot another plot i'll do so here uh, i'll try to plot the time versus maybe the detrended data okay so that is detrended uh, my data this was the variable and let me use a different color so let me call m for magenta okay then i want to plot another thing a time versus so anyway i know that the mean is very close to zero so i'll just uh, plot zero okay so just to show that the the mean value of my detrended data is close to zero so zeros of how many zeros you have to plot size of t right so size of t uh, comma let's use uh, say maybe dots k for black okay because if you use b b is for blue color so it's already a, it's already uh, what you call assigned a b for black so we cannot use b for sorry b for blue so k you have to use for black color okay so now we have given different color let me add the legend once again okay, just to specify what plot is what so first i have plotted the original data right second and my plot according to this you have to see so first plot is already there it is this so this is the original data then the second plot is for the trend then the detrended data and then mean of the detrended data these are what these are the different plots we can see on that graph so i have to specify the legend uh, now so legend the first option that i am going to plot is uh, the original data i have to tell once again because it's a different plot now so original data this will be the first plot then what is the second plot second plot is the trend 
right? Then there is a third plot coming up on the same graph that is for the detrended. Detrended data. And the fourth plot, let's just see plot, is the mean of the mean of detrended data. Capture right. legend, then go for X. So you don't have to uh, do anything like this now. I can simply copy this and paste. So this again is not required. So legend I can just remove now because legend is going to come up once again. All right, let's uh, see what's going to come now in the graph. Oh, okay, I cannot see the graph original graph now because you can see that the legend is overlapping. So what I do, I move the legend to a different location. You can do that by using this command. Okay. Come on, see, I can use dot 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 to go to a new line, right? Because it it tells the machine that something is going to continue in the next line. So I will specify where I want this legend. The identifier is location, right? The location I am I want is uh, right uh, the top left corner of the graph. So I can specify that by using an identifier called the Northwest. Right, I think this will solve the problem. Let's check now. Yeah, so you can see that this has been moved to the top left corner. If you say North, it will come at the center. If you, by default, it is Northeast, but definitely you can move it to East, uh, Southeast, then south, southwest, etc. Now I use the northwest. So northwest is this side, and you can see that the original data is uh, it was like this, and the trend you can see trend is actually a straight line which shows that the trend is to continuously increase function with fluctuation. Now when you do the detrend, you can see that the same fluctuations do exist, but it is right uh, that uh, slope has been eliminated. You can see this. And the mean of that has been changed to 10. Uh, sorry, 0, my mistake. Originally, this was somewhere 26, which was the mean. The mean has been reduced to some other way. Okay, so this is the whole thing. Now, if I remove the RNG, let's see. I'm going to get different, different graph uh, every time I run the code. Oh, sorry, my mistake. This has to be. You can see, right? So every time there was some trend and the trend is getting eliminated uh, whenever you do it. So the idea is that irrespective of what graph you have, right? What, uh, not, not just graph, what data set you have, right? It is always a good habit to remove the trend if at all you are dealing with some time series, okay? A time series data could be something like price of uh, uh, the stock price, or price of an object or you're predicting anything which actually continuously varying with time right so that's one good thing to have here uh, just as a pre-processing step uh, whenever it comes to the, uh, the initial phases of your project where you have the data pre-processing going on okay all right then let's move on to the next topic so here uh, we consider the various uh, arithmetic operations, right? We had seen all the operations, but we never looked at what is the precedence of uh, what you call the operators. So the next topic after the data pre-processing, right? Uh, only few examples are sufficient. We'll see them uh, in detail if we are uh, going ahead with any projects. All right, but as of now, uh, just to give you an introduction to you how to Pre-process the data. What are the op options you have? Uh, these two are sufficient. Okay. Next one uh, is uh, I'll go back to the arithmetic 
operation. This we are revisiting this, but the concept that we are going to discuss now is uh, something new which we had uh, not considered earlier. So uh, the topic that we are going to consider now is called as the uh, the precedence rule when we apply multiple operators for a uh, in the same command. So this is called as operator precedence. The same rule is applied for in almost uh, uh, all programming languages, right? But uh, since we are considering this under MATLAB, so let's look at the details. So what is the highest prefer uh, uh, the highest uh, what is the order, right, in which the precedence rule gets applied, right? When you use multiple, uh, what you call, uh, operations in the same command, so highest importance is given uh, to the brackets. So wherever you see the brackets, they are supposed to be solved first, right? This is the common rule in, even in math, right? Then you can see. Uh, the in MATLAB, the second uh, uh, order of precedence is for transpose, the power, complex conjugate transpose, matrix power, etc. Right. Then the unary val unary operators will come, like unary minus, unary plus, logical negotiation, right, and the matrix operations with the unary values, right. That comes the next. Then the unary arithmetics plus minus negotiation, followed by multiplication, division, uh, etc. The all the left division, right division, matrices, matrices, normal divi uh, division, etc. Will come in here. That's the fifth order. Then the addition and subtraction. Right. Then you can see the colon operator. After that, you have less than, greater than the relations relationship. Then you have the bitwise operator, element wise and the bitwise. So you can see that and comes first, then or in both the cases. So 12 different precedence uh, precedences have been defined in MATLAB and we are going to use them in the same order. Okay, whenever you are using what command I should write, what is the precedence, right? Uh, we have to identify according to this particular chart. Okay, that's important. Uh, then we'll go to in uh, mathematics, we had uh, we had considered all the operations and uh, the precedence is also given now. Let's move to the trigonometry. So MATLAB is a uh, language for scientific computing. So all sorts of uh, uh, mathematics should be supported. All right. So what are the options we have? What are the various functions available under the heading trigonometry? So the first set is related to the sine functions. So variety of sine operations are supported. So you can see here the first is simply SIN, which is a sine of this, provided it is given in degrees. Uh, sorry, radians. Yes, sine is for radians. Whenever you write sine of something, the inside bracket, whatever you have written, that will be considered only as radians. Even if you write in degrees like 45, it considers that as a 45 radian. So, how to enter degrees? Then you are supposed to enter the argument in degrees. You have to use sine d, indicating that you are going to perform the sine d operation of a degree value. So, sin d then bracket 45, it takes the 45 as a degree. Then again, you have various operations to do this. Uh, if you want to use sine of whatever x you en enter should be multiplied by pi. Like if I write sine d, sine pi bracket 2, it considers sine 2 pi, right? So, you don't have to specifically write the pi value each and every time you use the function. So what you can do, you can use sine pi. Then a sine for inverse sine, by default it is in, it expects the values to be in radians. Okay, then a sine d, so sine inverse function with the degree. So similarly, you have a hyperbolic sine function that is sine h. 
and inverse sine hyperbolic can be done using the a sine h okay so that is the that that includes all the set of functions which includes sine all right then we'll move on to the next set of commands that uses cosine so let's see how the cosine functions what are the various cosine functions so very similar to the sine you can see now we have the cosine functions of the following type one is simple cos which takes input in the form of radians cos d for argument in degrees cos pi for whatever value you enter will be multiplied pi by pi before taking the cosine ratio then a cos for inverse cos in radians a cos d for inverse cosine in degrees cos hyperbolic for hyperbolic cosine ratio and a cos h for inverse hyperbolic cosine function so sine is done cos is done uh, if you know the basics of mathematics uh, specifically trigonometry we can definitely find all the other ratios as well right tan uh, cosecant secant right and cot can be done but anyway so uh, using an, a, a, again a formula for the calculation is pretty much difficult right so for that what matlab has done is it provides you all the ratios right whichever ratio you want to calculate call a function to do that right so let's see the tan now so you can see the tan operation various tan operations supported by matlab one is tan tan d right so for radians and degrees respectively a tan and a tan d for inverse tan in radians and degrees respectively then there is another operation called fourth quadrant uh, inverse tangent so uh, again that can be done in uh, two ways one in degrees and one in radius right then uh, you have got uh, tan hyperbolic and a tan hyperbolic right for hyperbolic and inverse hyperbolic functions right then if you want to say calculate the cosecant right anyway cosecant is one by sine right but uh, again you don't have to calculate a sine separately to this okay directly you can use the following functions like so cosecant is csc then csc d for degrees input arguments in degrees a csc is inverse a csd is for inverse using degrees so cosecant hyperbolic as well as the inverse cosecant hyperbolic can also be uh, calculated by using the respective functions then let me show you the functions that we are going to use if our interest is to calculate the secant values okay so sec then secd for radians and degrees respectively a secant and a secant d for inverses in radians and degrees respectively followed by secant h and a secant h for hyperbolic and the inverse hyperbolic of the secant ratio then at last in the standard trigonometric functions we have a another ratio that is called as cotangent so in case of a cotangent the ratios can be calculated uh, by using the functions in matlab r one is a cot and the other one is cot d for radians and degrees then a cot and a cot d for inverses using the radians and degrees respectively followed by you can use the cot h and a cot h right whenever you want to uh, calculate the hyperbolic cotangent and inverse hyperbolic cotangents all right then let's move further the next set of functions that we are going to consider now are the functions which help us in calculation of the exponents one is exponents and also i might require the inverse of exponent which is a log function all these functions are pretty much important whenever we uh, do the coding of some algorithm right normally every algorithm uses uh, what you call 
these kind of exponents and the logarithms in uh, in common. So so what are the exponents and logarithmic functions supported? So you can see here, first one is exp. As the name suggests, it is used to calculate the exp exponential of something. Then you have another uh, commonly used function which is e to the power x minus one. That normally comes in some uh, denominators. So MATLAB has given a direct command to implement that. That is exp and one, right? Then you can use a log. That is a natural log by default, log to the base e. Then other logs are also supported like log 10, log 1p and log 2, where log 10 and log p are the base 10 and base 2. But log 1p is nothing but you are calculating log of 1 plus x. Again, you can see that log of 1 plus x is a very common uh, term in uh, most of the mathematical uh, series. You are trying to find sum of something, you get a log of that as an answer. So you can directly implement that. Then you have various exponential terms like next power 2, that is exponent of next higher power of 2, right? So you have x, you can calculate that. Then nth root, right? Of a real number, you can calculate any nth root. Then power 2, that is base 2, raising to something. This is normally used as mentioned here. It's a floating point number. Then real log, real power, uh, real square root, and the SQRT, that's a square root function. These are the most commonly and widely used uh, exponents and logarithm functions in MATLAB. Okay, so you can use them as and when you want, right? Even if even all these functions can be directly applicable to matrices as well, right? So you don't have to uh, see that it has to be a, a, applied to only the real numbers or something like that. You can even apply to the arrays. You can apply to matrices, multidimensional array, everything will work for each one of them. Okay, since we don't have that much time to go in details, and since you already know how to use the help for every function, right, you can go ahead and look at that. I'll uh, leave that to you. And if you get any doubt in understanding any of the, any of these functions, right, which we don't discuss in detail, right, if you get any doubt, you can come back at any point of time. All right, I will explain you in that case, right? How to, what exactly is that? We can even look at the uh, details of the functions with, ha with the help of some examples if needed. All right, kindly suggest when you need that. All right, now let's proceed further. The next set of uh, functions that we are going to discuss, again, I'm going to show you only the very important ones. There are thousands of functions available in MATLAB, but we will look at only the very important one, the very common one used in most of the program, most of the programs or most of the uh, algorithms, etc. So we are going to look at the next set of functions related to the, the complex numbers, which means the arithmetics, including the complex numbers. Uh, what are the various functions that we are going to use? Let us see. So. These are the list of functions that we commonly use. Okay, so <coughs> the first one is ABS, indicating that this is, you are trying to calculate the absolute value of the complex number, right? You get the magnitude. Then angle, the phase angle corresponding to uh, any complex number. These two are the uh, conversion of one form to other. We know that the first form is the rectangular format where you have the alpha plus j beta or alpha minus j beta is a complex number. The alpha comma beta can be converted into another format called polar format, which is r angle theta. So where r is the magnitude and theta is the uh, angle corresponding to that or the phase of that. So if you have alpha and beta, you can convert absolute and angles by using these two functions. Right. Then you can actually create the complex array by using a function called complex. You can get its conjugates by using C, O, and J. Then you can sort the complex numbers in the form of complex pairs by using a function called CPLX pair. Okay, then I and J are used as imaginary units. IMAG gives you the imaginary part. 
you can extract only the imaginary part of an array if you want is real is just to check that whether a particular uh, array has specific real numbers or are, are they completely real etc you can check that right then real is used to get the real part of an complex number sign gets you the signum function all right and unwrap is used to shift the phase angle right so you have a shift you, you can provide a shift to the phase angles by using unwrap so all these are the very common functions uh, of matlab which are used widely uh, whenever we do the program okay and uh, then all right then let's move on to the next topic so here also you can go ahead with all the functions and the details of the functions with the help of an example you can check using the help in matlab okay i'll leave that part as of now uh, because right uh, if i go with each and every pro every function with the complete details of the function right it's going to take a lot of time i'll just i'm just going to compress the time now for the time being all right okay so let's move on to the next part so basic uh, basically we had visited this topic once that is plots but if you remember we consider only two types of plots the very basic plots we had considered right but now we will go in, we are going to look at the uh, plots in pretty much detail so that we should know uh, the, the in detail how to plot and what are the various plots available in matlab this is very important because data visualization is one of the aspects that comes under the data analytics when i have a data i just want to know that what is there in the data all right so for that reason let's go into the details now the first type of plot that we are going to see is called as the uh, linear plots it's called as a line plot right so we'll see the details of line plot now let's go back to the matlab window. all right now first uh, let me do this in the command window itself. I don't want uh, uh, to write a M file. Okay, so let me create an X axis because X and Y axis should be defined before you plot something. So let me create this between zero uh, and I want to give a spacing of 0 0.05 and my last number is five. Okay, I want to create an array. This gets created over there as you can see uh, in the uh, workspace then let me create y okay so y uh, is equal to i'll use a sine function of see this is x every x should be raised uh, to the power 2 okay i create a y like this and i call a figure and in the figure right this is just a figure that has been created now and in this uh, figure, right, only the figure has been created, but nothing, there, there is no plot, okay? You, can, you don't see any plot there because I have not called a plot command yet. So now I call plot. So plot along the x-axis plot the x values, along the y-axis plot the y values. Now you see the plot will show you something. Okay, so this plot is a simple, uh, it's a normal plot. It's a very simple plot and a normal plot which creates a line plot of x and y values. In the sense, the closest values of x and, x and y values get connected using a straight line. We don't see the straight line here because they are very close. Okay, so because of that reason, we don't see the straight lines here, but still, this is a line plot. Okay, now we uh, what if I want to plot uh, two different plots on the same thing, right? So let me create uh, one more. Let me say this is y2 uh, is equal to, y2 is equal to, say I'll use another one that is called as a cos, okay? Cos of, uh, say, 2 into, this is x dot power 3. I'll create a new function, okay? That is y2. Now, 
uh, one option is that you you called hold on, then you call a plot so that the plot comes over there. But other option is that now you see I clear the uh, figure now. So whatever figure I have here, I can clear the figure by simply using close. So if you press close, you can see that that particular uh, plot is gone. All right. So now what I do, I will call the plot function. Right, but I will plot two functions simultaneously. That is, one is x comma y, one more is x comma the y t. You can do this, right? When you do this, you can see that both plots are there. The first original plot you can see there, right? This is the blue colored plot, and the second plot which I just have created, that the cosine function, right? That looks like this. I can make it more clear because I think I created a very complicated number. I'll just make it as say. Sorry, the y2 is simply, I'll make maybe simply x squared. This should look more clear compared to what I created earlier. All right, so this is y2 and now I call the plot. Let me see this looks more clear. Okay. Only blue plot is visible. Just a second. Let me change that. All right, uh, now actually uh, the, all the plots have been closed, right? Now I plot this, you know, what you are seeing, all right? Uh, I think you can see two different plots over there on the same graph, correct? One is in red color, one is in blue color, right? So uh, that's the, uh, that's what we can do when we use the plot function itself for two different functions, two different plots. Plot x comma y will plot the first one that is a blue color graph and then when I call the plot of uh, x comma y2 I'm trying to plot right the second one as well. Okay and now uh, the next in uh, next we are going to see the, the similar uh, things can be plotted using a different type of uh, visualization. This is called as a bar plot, right? This is also very important when you are going to look at the discrete uh, plots, right? They can be visualized using what is called as a bar plot. That's a plot number two that we are going to see. Right? This is a bar plot. Okay, let's go back to the MATLAB screen to see how to use the bar. Right, so let me create a uh, the axis first. So x, I want this to vary from say minus uh, 2.9. I want to have a gap of 0 0.2 and I want to come till 2.9. Okay, it creates x axis and uh, I want to plot the uh, y as y is equal to uh, let me say it's a e to the power so exponential of uh, e to the minus x square all right so e to the minus x square is dot into because every number should be multiplied by uh, the the corresponding number so x dot star x all right x dot x is matrix multiplication will not satisfy that that's why it is a minus x dot x, okay, element by element. So create a y, and now you see if you want to, if you say plot, uh, plot of uh, say x comma y, right, this is what you get. You get something like this, right? I don't see the point by point. Every point, like minus 2.9, what value? Minus 2.8, what value? I don't see, right? For that reason, you, instead of calling the plot function, I just want to see the bar graph, so call a function called bar, B A R, of same thing. I want to plot x versus y. Call this. Okay, now you see the details, right? So point by point, you can see the values, right? So this is this value, next value is this. So in between, you don't have any other value, correct? Like that. So minus one point, yes. So you can see minus 1.1, 1 
this is minus 0.9 this value and so on right so you see this is another way of visualization of the data and this kind of graphs are called as the bar graphs let's uh, now move on to the next type of plots so after the bar uh, plot the third type of plot which is very useful and very important is called as a staircase plot all right now uh, let's quickly look at the okay how to how to write uh, how to use the staircase plots So let's create uh, the x axis first. So x uh, is equal to, so starting from 0, this is 0 0.25, and I want to go till say 10. And then maybe y is equal to sine of simply x. It treats the sine function. Now, instead of looking the normal plot you want to go for a staircase plot means you can use the function stairs of x comma y okay so you can see that the, the graph changes now you can see the staircases right as the graph over here so this is how you can use the staircase uh, graphs in MATLAB so it's just another view of the uh, data which we already have, which is a sign. Okay, then uh, there is another very important type of graph. This is used for anal analyzing the results of uh, some experiment, right? Whenever you have an experiment with some error, uh, in order to visualize uh, what you call the actual answer, and you are trying to overwrite the actual answers uh, and you want to plot how much is the error at that point, right? So you want to overwrite the actual values with error by using a specific type of uh, plot and that plot is called as the error, error bar plot. Right. So uh, when I plot, you understand what exactly is this. Right. This is the analysis tool. So whenever we have some answer of uh, some experiment or some algorithm and you want to see how much uh, error is there at every point and you want to overwrite even the error on the same graph, you use this kind of uh, plot. It's called as error bar. So let's create the x and y values first. So say x is equal to uh, I want to start with say minus 2. I want to have an increment of 0 0.1 and I want to go till 2. Okay, similarly, I'll create the y value is equal to. So let me create a, there is an inbuilt function called erf for creation of an error function. erf, since we are going to deal with the errors here, I will create this itself. Okay, error function of x. Right, so this creates the error function and also. I'll create an error bar, right? Error bar has to be present at each position of x with some value, right? So I'll create a EB now. This is for the error, error bar is equal to, I don't want to create a larger error. I want to restrict the error to be between 0 to 1. So the best option is to use a R, A, and D because I know that rand function creates random numbers between 0 and 1. Okay, how many values you want? It's equal to the size of the variable x. Whatever is the size of x, that value you create. But I want to reduce the error further by dividing it by some number. Maybe I'll want to divide this by seven. Let's assume. So the error becomes very small. Now you say what you want to plot. I want to plot uh, the error. So this is, right? So you see, as I told, you have to have an answer with you. Right? Answer in the sense for in this case, you did an experiment. Let's say your answer is present in Y. Okay, Y holds the answer of your experiment. So I may have uh, so maybe some 20 different values possibly. 
between minus 2 to plus 2. Right. And the at each point you have an error calculated that is EB. Right. Now I want to plot x, y, and eb. All of all of them to be uh, should be presented. So the function to be called is error bar. Right. Specify the same way what is along x-axis, what is along y-axis, and where you have stored the error. Okay, simply call this. Now you can see that, right? Uh, it's very clear that uh, the blue colored plot, the straight, the line plot is the actual uh, result, that is y. And at every point, you can see that there is a possible error. There is a small error possible. How much is the error, right? The actual value is minus 9928. Okay, but there is a delta in the sense your actual, there is an error of so much. Right, that varies between minus 0.09, uh, sorry, 0 0.09038 to plus 0 0.09038. So much error is possible. So at this point, you have much smaller error. You can see here there is a bigger error possible. And like you see, at every point, what is the possible error can also be visualized simultaneously with the normal plot. This kind of plot is called as the error bar. Okay, very useful in the uh, result analysis of most of uh, our, uh, what you call, uh, algorithms. All right, then let's move further. Then after the error bar, the next one that we are going to consider is another important plot. The fifth one, this is called as a polar plot right where my they, i don't have a x axis and y axis i have angle as one axis angle versus magnitude okay so this particular uh, polar plot basically deals with the plot of a radius value radius is the magnitude radius r versus an angle that is theta right let's quickly look at uh, this polar plots in that line so let's create the theta variable now theta is the angle and i know that i want to start from zero Again, normally you create in radians, okay, 0 0.01 radians is the step size. I want to go till the 360 degrees, that is 2 pi. It creates theta. And let's say the R value, the radius is equal to, let's, uh, let me make a standard function that is magnitude of, that is ABS of, say, sine of, uh, okay, 2 sine of 2 theta into cos of 2 into theta. Okay, let me close the brackets properly. All right, so let's, I think this creates R. So simply create the polar plot by calling polar plot. And what is the x-axis? Normally, the first variable is theta. Okay, theta, comma, it says the radius, that is r for us. So, simply call this. You can see that it creates a plot in this way. So, whenever your theta changes from 0 to 30 degree, the radius is going to change like this. Okay, it comes till this point. So, you can see that at, at exactly a point, what is the r and theta value, you can calculate. All right, so this plots directly in degrees so that we can understand, but internally the calculation, every calculation that's going to happen uh, will be in the form of radians only because we are entering in the radian format only. All right, we could cover few of the plots uh, today and the remaining plots we are going to see in the next class.